Hey guys, welcome to another edition of the Sharpening Report. This is Jake Rahutsky, and I'm here tonight with a very special guest, Josh Tolley. Uh, we're really pleased to have him tonight. Thanks for joining us tonight, Josh. Oh, thanks for having me. It's a pleasure. Awesome. Well, Josh, why don't you uh, just go ahead and give the viewers a little bit of a background. I'm sure a lot of them know who you are, but if they don't, sure. just lay a little bit of groundwork for kind of where you come from and what you're doing, man. Sounds good. Uh, I host the Josh Tolley Show. It's a nationally syndicated show. People can find it on radio stations all across the, the great United States and 160 nations across the planet. Uh, then go to joshtullygod.com, find out more about that. I air Monday through Friday, 9 to 11. Uh, I'm also an author. I uh, have a number of best-selling books out on Amazon. Uh, what else? I'm listed as one of the top 100 business trainers in the world. I've been a television anchor for presidential debates, so I'm politically active. So kind of politics, religion, and money. Everything your mom told you not to talk about at Thanksgiving. <laughs> Yeah, no, I hear you, man, and you cover some really interesting topics, and you you seem to really be uh, have your thumb on the pulse of what's going on politically, spiritually, and everything, man. So it's really an honor to have you tonight. So tell us, Josh, what's the what's kind of the big thing that's been going on right now that you've been following lately? Oh man, this this uh, countering foreign disinformation and propaganda act that that little gem. Yeah that they hid inside NDA 2017. That's, that's really been a bone for me to chew on the last few days, last week or so. Because they did it, of course, on December 23rd, and they hid it inside NDA 2017. So a lot of people have been watching my interviews on that. And it's generating a lot of uh, questions and comments and, and ideas on how to get rid of it. But at the same time, it's kind of exposing how little a lot of people know about how this whole process works. Like a lot of people think, well, Trump can just arbitrarily undo it, and that's not how it works at all. So that's, that's kind of what I've been talking about, that and the economy and, of course, the event that we're going to be at. Interesting. So the NDA is, uh, for my education purposes, the NDA is something that was passed that had a bunch of like uh, ulterior motive type stuff uh, embedded in it. Oh, yeah. Yeah. So every year they do the National Defense Authorization Act, which is the NDAA, and then they add whatever year to the end of it. So this year, it's fiscal year 2017. So it was NDAA 2017. There's two versions of it. There's a House version and a Senate version. A lot of people looked up the House version and said, what are you talking about? It hasn't even passed yet. That's not the one that's going to pass. That one's now dead because the Senate version passed the Senate. It passed the House, got signed by the president, and they did it on Friday afternoon, right before Christmas, December 23rd. And they did it so nobody would pay attention to it. And part of the reason, of course, is the $611 billion that they're spending inside of that act. But that's not really the hook and the crook of this thing. The hook and the crook of this thing is the Countering Foreign Disinformation and Propaganda Act that was attached to it. Now, the interesting thing about that is that it sets up, uh, well, not sets up, it empowers this already existing entity, the um, Board of Broadcast Governors or Governor Broadcasting Board, whatever it is. And this is a group of, of individuals that come from, well, like Universal, uh, they come from Voice of America, a lot of media players, a lot of establishment players, a lot of anti-Christian sort of players. And they're in this board. Now, that board, along with the Department of Defense, the State Department, and a bunch of other alphabet soup agencies, are going to be in charge of distributing factual information. And you might be thinking, well, what's the big deal about that? I mean, factual information is good, right? Not when the government gets to decide what is and what is not factual. Now, a lot of people think, well, it's foreign disinformation and propaganda. Irrelevant. It's absolutely irrelevant. Because if you look back at our history, one, we do this in other countries. President Barack Obama spent $200 million on foreign propaganda into Israel trying to unseat Benjamin Netanyahu. So we do this. But in above and beyond that, we've been doing this since the beginning. Benjamin Franklin went to Europe to do press, to do media, to get that press on board, to get the people to support the American rebels at the time, which became the United States. So we engage in this all the time. But here's where it gets even trickier. 
what happens is, just like with the Patriot Act, remember how they told us that, oh, we're not spying on your phone calls, we're just spying on foreign phone calls. Well, what they decided was if, let's say, I was on the phone with Tom Horn or something, and they wanted to listen to it, they would route the signal through Canada and back again. Thus, it became a foreign phone call. And it, it allowed them to easily, more easily tap into this, this phone call without a warrant. Well, if you notice, uh, in October, we gave control of the internet over to the international community. So now the internet is a foreign entity. It means that if I'm at home thinking, well, it doesn't matter, I'm not a foreign news source. Well, you are if you put it out on the internet, because now the internet's foreign. And this is the part that people aren't getting. They're, they're thinking, oh, you know, you're making a mountain out of a molehill. This is just to counter what Russia did. And of course, that's, that's a load too, but we can get into that later. Well, so let me ask you this, Josh. So when do you anticipate the lockdown or what exactly do you think is going to happen as a result? Like, I realize the implications are basically everything is restricted, but have we started to see that maybe? Oh, yeah. Overtly? Oh, it's yeah. Good. Yeah. Yeah. We've already started to see that. See, this is this is what I call regulation by proxy. Everybody's waiting for some sort of martial law marching down right. the street. It's not going to happen that way for a number mm -hmm. of reasons, but it's not. What's going to happen is they're going to regulate by proxy. Right. So let's back up a little bit to the fact that we have no more lead smelting plants. The last lead smelting plant went out of business December 31st of 2015. Before that, there was this UN gun treaty. And all the patriots and libertarians and freedom lovers and truthers were saying, oh, well, we're not part of the UN gun treaty because we didn't sign it. It was never ratified by Congress. Didn't really matter because what happened is the people who are part of that treaty have all agreed not to sell ammunition to countries that are not part of that treaty, which means we're being affected by it anyway. Then they shut down the last lead smelting plant so we can't produce cheap ammunition in the United States. So in a way, they roundabouted ammo regulation and gun regulation by having nothing really happen. And the nothing really happen sort of situation has caused a lot to happen. In this case, we're already seeing countries like France and Spain tell uh, companies like Twitter and Facebook, if you allow fake news to be published on your site, you'll face a $500,000 fine. So now it's not, well, is it martial law, boots on the ground, you know, clamped down? No, they're just going to fine you. So you can do whatever you want, you just have to pay the price. And that's where it gets even more interesting. Why is it that all these countries, I think it's 15 or 16 countries now, have all decided to fight fake news? I mean, we can't even decide what a terrorist is, for goodness yeah. sakes. But all these countries can agree on what fake news is all at the same time? That's a little odd. And then if you look at the wording in this bill, they mention Russia. Well, the bill, which was written by Republicans, was originally penned back in May before we had a Russia media problem. Mm -hmm. So wait a second, now there's all this fake evidence, because there's not any evidence, of this Russian hacking, right? Oh, Russian did it, Russia media, Russia media. The White House still hasn't produced a shred of evidence. The hearings that they had today really hasn't produced anything. So there's no proof of this, but they want to blame Russia as the reason for having to control media. Well, wait a second, how did they know Russia was going to be a problem when they wrote it in May and even the White House said we didn't know about it until the end of summer? Hmm. So there's a lot of, it's, it's a lot deeper than it seems sort of situation going on here. And I think sometimes we take this a little too lightly because we're expecting some sort of crackdown yeah. or martial law and that's not what we expect. But that's not how you how you catch a fish anyway. If you ever catch a fish by hand, you do it really, really, really slowly. Yeah, that's interesting, Josh, because most people, that's what they say. It's like, uh, you know, the beginning of 2017, martial law, everything's getting shut down. But it makes a lot more sense if you slowly heat up the water in the pot so people get acclimated with each phase of it. So that makes a lot more sense, man. So I guess what's going to what's going to begin happening is restrictions are going to be made and slight rules mm -hmm. and changes are going to be added. I'll give you an example. YouTube just added one where basically you have to click the bell when you subscribe to someone to be notified of their posts. So I can see I can see exactly what you're talking about in levels of 
basically filtering on Facebook. You know, uh, there's a lot of things on YouTube even that are off topic in regards to monetization. Like you right. cannot monetize if you mention anything about Iraq or a war or if you talk yep. about anything political. Basically, you will get right. shut. They they will not allow you to monetize. But on everything else. It's free game. If you're talking pop music or whatever really doesn't matter, those are the things that they're not going to restrict you on. But it's very interesting, man, because I'm starting to see what you're talking about because this could, like you said, happen just in gradual phases. So, yeah. man, we'll have to, I'll have to keep a close eye on this too and keep us, I mean, I'm sure you'll keep us posted with the things you're running into. As of right now, we, we still have the freedom of speech from the standpoint that we can still do what we're doing. But, man, I would hate to think that the day is coming anytime soon where basically we just basically get shut down. Because yeah, you and I – yeah, go ahead. We don't have the freedom of speech. Because even, even right now, there's, there's a law mm -hmm. that says if the Secret Service is present someplace, the Constitution is suspended. The freedom of speech is suspended. Which is why when I went to the DNC and the RNC, they had free speech zones. You can only have your constitution over there in the corner. So we don't have free speech. See, that's, that's the illusion. It's little by little by little until one day we don't even realize we were captured. You know, people tend to say, well, you know, martial law is going to be this boots on the ground sort of scenario. But if you look at a dog, right, mm -hmm. a dog running around in a fenced yard knows he's fenced in. But one day his master, his owner, takes down the fence and unbeknownst to the dog, he gets a little collar around his neck and today he's going to run as hard as he can for the, the house next door. He goes to cross the fence and wham, he gets zapped. Well, he was in the invisible fence, wasn't he? And that's what we have. See, 1960s doomsday martial law, that would have been boots in the street. But now... They can restrict your internet access. Uh, you need a passport to leave, what is it, six or seven states starting next year. Mm. So they're restricting your freedom. A squirrel has more freedom than you do. You can't leave and come back into this country without permission. But a squirrel can run across the border in Michigan, run back across the Sault Ste. Marie Bridge, and nobody's going to card the squirrel. So you're not even as free as the squirrel. It's illegal to collect rainwater in 17 states. Yeah. In California, they made retroactive building codes so they could go after people who already put in alternative energy sources to get off the grid. Yeah. And that's, that's why this is dangerous, because we don't notice that freedom is lost until it affects us directly. Well, I think I figured a workaround for this problem, Josh. I can self-identify as a squirrel and cross the border without permission <laughs> and just say, hey, guys, I'm a squirrel. Leave me alone. <laughs> yeah. 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 It, I like that idea. It, it's crazy, man, because, like, insanity is becoming the norm, and the norm is labeled as insanity, man. Did you see what was oh, yeah. going on in regards to, in California, them decriminalizing prostitution for children under the age of 18? Did you see that? Yeah. So, yeah. And a Go ahead. Go ahead. Yeah. No, I was just going to well, say, I gonna... so I, I was just going to say, so basically the gist of it is the idea is they're, they're thinking they're going to make it softer on the kids that are involved in this like pre, you know, under the age of 18 prostitution. But in reality, what they're going to do is widen. This is exactly what you're talking about, man, is to have one step at a time. I said this yep. years ago and I still say it is, after, you know, homosexuality is fully approved across the board and it's given the okay for everything, you know, basically like we have to uh, treat it as like basically give it rights, right? Like sexual identity, give it rights. Once you do that, the next step is, um, you know, gender bending. And then the next step after that is pedophilia. And I had people look at me uh, and just basically say, you're out of your mind. But if you look back in history, Josh, if we look back in history, what was happening in Pompeii? What was happening in Rome? What was happening in many of these ancient civilizations? They actually had legal pedophilia going on. In fact, it was rampant. And in Pompeii, uh, boy prostitutes were almost more common than other forms of prostitution. And so, and these societies were actually destroyed as well. They came. Yeah, under you're having that in strategies. Islam too. Yeah, and so, uh, man, I'm really hoping. So. I know we've got a lot of things to cover in, in the interim, but let me ask you this. What about having a new commander-in-chief in office? What is it that Trump could do 
and what can he not undo currently? Because I know you discussed this with Derek Gilbert the other day when you were talking about this topic. So I want to cover that for people as well. Like what exactly can he do and push back? And what is it that we no longer have control over? So here's the deal. I am optimistic with the new president coming into office. I'm optimistic. But people have to understand that this is not an executive order. People tend to think that, you know, right after he swears in, he can turn around and say, undo that. That's not how bills and rules and laws work. That's how executive orders work. He can totally do those. But when it comes to law, when it comes to an actual bill, we don't want a system like that. That because if because let's say we elected Barack Obama, he could turn around and say, "Okay, make every bearded man illegal or something." You can't just have arbitrary. Mm-hmm. I'm, I nullify this. How you get rid of a bill is that the Congress and uh, both houses, Senate and uh, House of uh, Representatives, they have to repeal it, which is what they're trying to do with Obamacare. But think about this: this bill was written by the Republicans. This is not Obama's bill. It was written by Republicans. It it was a Republican Party bill. So now you would have to expect the Republican Party to repeal their own bill. That's a long shot. Even if it happened, it's like fifth or sixth in the line of priority. So you're not going to get to it for two, three years. Did they not know know what was in it? Oh, no, no, no. They knew what was in it. See, that's the thing. The Republicans wrote it. This is a Republican bill. Mm -hmm. So... This is why we have to be really careful, even with people with R's after their name. It doesn't mean they're good. So yeah. it's it's going to be two, three years before they would even get to repealing that that part anyway. But even if they did, here's the other nasty part. They attached it to NDAA 2017, which means they would have to repeal the entire bill. Well, now, there's a workaround where they could, they could somehow exempt part of a bill, and that's technically legal, but it's harder to do, and it would take more time. The, the fastest way, the two- to three-year way, is to repeal the entire bill. Well, they know nobody's going to repeal the Defense Authorization Act, because mm-hmm. so, that would undo the Pentagon's budget. The, you know, it's, it's just a bigger mess than, than they think it's worth. So repealing is not really the option. The second workaround is that Donald could somehow defund or reassign the personnel. That's possible. The third thing that could happen is that it could be declared unconstitutional by the Supreme Court. But there's a couple problems with that. One, there's a vacancy on the Supreme Court right now. Maybe two or three more coming. Before you would want to take this to the Supreme Court, you would want to fill that vacancy. Because right now, it might not be too good. So you would want to fill the vacancy, which means they would have to go through the whole approval process of the new justice. Then somebody would have to bring the suit. Mm-hmm. You know, they, it's not like you can just walk in there and say, hey, is this legal? So somebody would have to bring a suit, and the Supreme Court would have to agree to take the, the case. So again, you're looking at a year or two out. Yeah. So there's no, there's no fast, yep, Donald Trump can just get in office and undo this. No. So um, I, I guess what I'm trying to still wrap my head around is if the Internet now belongs to this international community, who decides what happens? Like, who, like how do we keep track of what their plans are? Is there any documents out there that say, I've heard of Internet 2.0. I know Alex Jones has talked a, a lot about it. I don't know right. all the facts behind it or if that is, in fact, the true plan. But it sounds like, man, under these laws, under this change, the Internet 2.0 is just a jump and skip away. Oh, yeah, it, it totally is. It totally is. And if, if you actually look at the routing of whatever Internet you're using right now, mm. a lot of times it bounces internationally anyway. So, again, foreign. But uh, in, in terms of is this coming, who controls it, where can we find documentation, I have no clue. And that's part of the problem. The government doesn't have to be accountable. Yeah, it because used, the government's no longer centralized. It used to be, man, that your ISP would come through some local place that you could identify as an IP address, you know, like a location. Right. When I lived in Kansas City, it got to the point that my IP address was always being routed through Chicago, which they've got black ops sites and stuff like that there. In fact, I could go to Google and whenever I would do anything, it would say I'm in Chicago, basically. So. I know they're doing this type of stuff. They're rerouting stuff. And I mean, it's, 
I don't know. It's it's scary stuff, but man, I guess it's it's to be expected with the way things are going today. How how do you think we as Christians and as people who are maybe aware of these issues, how do we fight this thing? Like, I, I instead of just fighting it in the courtroom, because obviously it's going to take a long time to undo these things. But is there loopholes or workarounds that you think people will figure out to still operate uh, in ambiguous ways, maybe with these shifts that are going to take place? Yeah, there are. There, there are workarounds. I'm not going to talk about that. <laughs> not in Google Plus. Right. But yeah. 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 <laughs> there, there, hey guys, there are. Here's our plan. Yeah. <laughs> no, there, there, there are workarounds. They're not mass workarounds, though. So that's part of the problem. You know, when, whenever you try to control a population, you're going to have some leakage. Whether you're trying to cr- control rats or you're trying yeah. to control the American people, you're going to have some leaks. And as long as it's not too big of a problem, it's negligible. So they're not really concerned about the workarounds. The reality is, though, part of it, we have to start to say, wait a second, this is kind of our fault. Mm-hmm. Now, I'm not saying all hope is lost as long as there's breath in our lungs and God's on the throne. Hallelujah. But this is kind of part of our fault. We didn't hold the ground that we had. You can't really blame the enemy for doing what the enemy was supposed to do, which is be the enemy. Gave up territory. We stopped living our beliefs. We started being readers of the word instead of doers of the word. Matter of fact, 7 out of 10 Christians haven't even read the Bible. So we started asking government to take our place. This whole conservative Christian right right? That was the whole thing. Instead of praying to God, we pray to government. Instead of, well, God, we need more money. Government, we need more money. We need more jobs. Government, we need more jobs. And Christians have turned government into a God. Mm -hmm. So when that happens, what does the Bible say happens next? So the reality is, what we need to do is hit our face and repent, and then be doers of the word, not just hearers of the word. Yeah. No, I hear what you're saying, man. And, um, in regards to Christians never having read the Bible, man, that's it's sad if seven Christians really have never not like read the Bible through. Um, now, I know there's a lot of people that read the Bible like on a daily basis or whatever, but man, as believers, you would think we should all have done that at some point, right? I mean, I've read the Bible through. I can't say I read it through all the time, but I'm definitely feeding myself the word all the time. But I mean, the whole idea of Christianity and the whole idea of being in Christ is being renewed, renewing your mind, having a renewed spirit. And man, without that word, we can't do that. So that's crucial. I think it's I think things have just gotten comfortable all around, man. I think Christians have gotten comfortable in this country and we're being provided so much entertainment. We're being provided so much uh, comfort from the things of the world that we're not really paying attention to the things that matter, you know, and by the time we figure out what's going on, man, it's going to be, it's going to be persecution time, you know, uh, for a lot of the people out there that are just watching Sunday afternoon football and that's all they care about. Oh yeah. And then speaking of Sunday, you know, you have all these churches Mm -hmm. that aren't doing what they're supposed to do either because of 501 C three status. Sometimes that's part of it. But honestly, the larger part of it is is pastors don't want to offend their congregation and lose those wonderful donations and, and butts in seats. That's really larger than the 501c3 factor. In this past election cycle, I spoke to at least 15 people who said, Josh, I stopped going to church because church stopped being relevant. It all became feel-good messages, concerts for 30 minutes beforehand, and then everybody's out of there within an hour and a half. And that's not church. That's not, that's not biblical church. Yeah. So they have let go. And, you know, you, you bring up some very interesting points about, you know, if we're supposed to be followers, read the book. Not only is that stat not true, it's actually over 7 out of 10. I think it's like 76% or whatever it is. But it's, it's insane. It's almost 8 out of 10 Christians have never read the book. But in addition to that, even fewer uh, than that is the people who've read it but don't study it. Right. Like they, they, they just read it like, you know, one pass through and, yep, okay, cool, I'm out of here. And really at that point, you're just becoming a fan of Christianity. You're not becoming yeah. a believer. It's like somebody who says, yeah, I know the lineup for the Green Bay Packers. I have a Packer jersey, and there's Packer art on my wall. Yay, I'm a Packer. No, you're not. Yeah. So that, yeah. that is starting to happen. And to be honest, it, it's a little bit of an encouragement because we're seeing right now 3 million people a year leave churches. Churches 7,000 a year are shut down, so people are leaving. But at the same time, there's something wonderful happening. The people who are staying are becoming more 
committed, more yeah. resolved, more true, more pure. They're living it. Right. They're studying it. They're they're walking it out. Right. No, and you know, it's it's interesting because um you know, in regards to church, in regards to the things going on at church, I think I think in the last days, eventually, man, the mega church is going to go to the wayside. The reason being is it takes a lot of money to run. Mm -hmm. It's a huge, you know, it's like a basically like a business. And back in in early Bible history with the early church, they went from house to house. The fellowship of the of believers was really the focus of the church. That's the primary reason. You know, your Christian walk and your faith and all that is in is acted out outside those meeting groups, right? The 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 meeting with the body of Christ was simply to reinforce that. But today it's backwards. People go to church to be fed and to be they they use the church as their entire source of their Christian walk. And then the other six days of the week they just do their own thing. So it's all backwards, right? Well, I think eventually the way things will shift is when difficult things happen, persecution happens, and when the difficult times happen, people turn back to Christ. What's going to happen? They're going to get so radical that they don't need they don't need necessarily to go to a big building. They're going to fellowship with the other people that are radical around them, you know. And I've I've heard yep. this story many times from people that say, I, I can't go to church anymore. I can't find a church that really even feeds me. You know, it's it's three points in a poem. There's a lot of uh, yep. there's a lot of feel good stuff, but again, man, if it's not if it's not deep and if it's not really coming from the spirit of God, you're not going to really receive a lot from that. And I'm not I'm not here to come against mainstream church. That's not the point. The point right. is that um, I, I think it will shift eventually, but it's going to take some persecution here in America. And I'm not a doomsday guy, but as we know, man, if you look at history. It's happened time and time again, and we're probably due here pretty soon for another kind of Christian persecution here in America. We haven't really seen it here in America, but I think we will here because things have shifted so much. There's been such a morality shift. There's so much darkness that's accepted over light. Yep. And in the media, Christianity is being persecuted right now. We just haven't seen it with feet on the ground. Uh, and... I, I think that could be around the corner, man. In the next several years here, you could begin to see serious persecution of believers. Yeah, and we have to remember, too, that doomsday necessarily isn't always doomsday because God promises in the Bible that he disciplines those he loves. And yeah. sometimes that happens because his plan needs to be executed. So even in those things, take joy, right? Yeah. So we have to say, hey, wait a second. Is it doomsday or is it God saying, hey, Press down, shake it up, and see what happens. Because in any time, I mean, look at China. China's underground church. Those people are amazing believers. They memorize the Bible, for goodness mm -hmm. sakes. They give their life if they have to. Right. Well, persecution in times creates a more devout following. It yeah. separates the wheat from the chaff. It, 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 it sets a fire, and what's not good burns away. Like, that's what well, persecution does. In China, they've been praying for the persecution of a ch of the church in America for years because they realize that. And this yeah. is, this is something that hit me a while back, Josh. It was really profound when it finally registered. But I never understood. Like God always says, He's going to judge the church first, and it seems like all oh, like it's out of order, right? Like maybe He should judge the sinners first and then the church. But then I realized, and it hit me: the reason God judges the church first is because if the church gets right and they repent. They can influence the world around them and lead people to Jesus and be the light, right? If he judges the world first and judges them in their sin, then what happens is you have many lost souls that cannot be reached for Christ, maybe even perished, right? And so the order of things is always to bring judgment to the house of God first so they can correct themselves, get right, and then reach the lost because God's heart is souls. He wishes that none should perish. And when that finally registered with me, I was like, it makes sense. I understand now. Uh, correction of the church is a very positive thing. And persecution, even though it's not fun, will actually be a positive thing in this country when we get there. Now, I hope and I pray that we have a season, man, where the church will repent and just make changes and begin to shift things the yes. other direction without the persecution. And I think that's going to happen. I think we're going to see a season coming up, Josh. I really believe that we are going to see more revival in the United States, more revivals happening. Yep. And then we're going to have another great awakening, right? Now, maybe after that persecution comes, 
as as a result of it. But my prayer is that we have another season of that before these, uh, you know, deadly end times comes. But, you know, we're not promised anything. God's word says, you know, right. the, the earth and the stars and basically the galaxies, I'm paraphrasing, were rolled up as a scroll, right? So we know everything's going to fade away eventually. But, um, yeah, people in the chat are saying they pray that we're right. I, I feel the same way. And I feel that I I like the idea of Trump coming into office if he's going to do what mm -hmm. he says he's going to do. But there's no promise about that. What's your take on that, man, with the whole Trump situation? Well, I think I think Trump maybe offers us that delay. Uh, I think if Hillary would have won, oh, man. <laughs> but she didn't. And so Trump could possibly give us that delay, give that church the time it needs to have what you were talking about, that revival. But I think this revival is going to be a real revival. Yeah. We kind of go through waves, you know, where right. like in the 90s and early 2000s, there was the mega church wave. And yeah. nothing against that. It is what it is. It is what it is. But I, there's a lot of, of false conversions in mega yeah. churches. That's just reality. But well, this time, oh, go ahead. No, I was just going to say, and I think sometimes you have trendy revivals where they're trying yeah. to instigate because of the, you know, it's a, it's kind of a cool idea and we want to be the trendy people. Like, I think that happens a lot where you get a little bit of excitement, but then it fades away. I think the last real move that we had here was during the Jesus movement, like back in the 60s and 70s. Um, after yeah. that, there have been small revivals here and there, but nothing on the scale of like the Great Awakening, right? There's been five total and the sixth one I'm hoping is within our lifetime, but go ahead. Well, and I, I, I think we're starting to see it. You know, I, I think that's kind of what I was getting at in a way where we're seeing people leave, but the ones who are staying and the ones who are converting are becoming like real diehard believers. It's just yeah. not, you know, what I do on Sunday from 11 to, to 12. It's how I live and, and walk. But I, I think overall, back to the Trump thing, I think it might offer us that window if we can take advantage of it. That's yeah. our window to go out and establish his, his principles in people's hearts, right? Yeah. But in addition to that, we have to be careful too. We can't just rest back and say, oh, well, yeah. Trump's in. I don't have to worry. And I'm seeing a lot of that. I am seeing a ton of that. Well, I don't care how great Trump is. Praise God, you know, lead him to Jesus, all that sort of stuff. But it's not just one man. There's all these other entities. And if this past election session taught us anything, is look at how corrupt this thing is. Mm -hmm. I, was, I was talking to somebody who's connected to Trump's campaign. And I said, you know, as soon as I found out that the FBI was not going to recommend prosecuting Hillary Clinton for all of her guilt that they said she had. As soon as I found out that if I was Donald Trump, I would have hired additional private security. Because to me, that shows the system itself is compromised. Mm -hmm. There's a crack in there somewhere. And you, you come to find that uh, FBI Director Comey was actually on the board of HSBC, which gave millions of dollars to the Clinton Foundation. So the corruption line runs deep. It's not one man. I mean, look what happened to JFK. Look what happened to Abraham Lincoln. Yeah. You know? So you have to say, yep, there's an opportunity here. We don't just pray to the government and hope they do it. It's our chance to go out and do it. It's kind of like he's running block. He's that, he's that pulling guard off the line, right, in football. He's pulling. Mm -hmm. He's going to run a block, but we still have to run. And that's what Paul's talking about, run the race to win it. Right. Yeah, and it's interesting, man, because, you know, God's word says that he sets up and tears down the rulers. So we know that, you know, in regards to America, God knows what's going on. He's in control. Mm -hmm. And ultimately, whatever happens with this nation is a result of his decisions. But it's also partially a result of, I mean, it's a good part result of our decisions. You know, will my people turn, repent, turn from their wicked ways, and then the then he will heal our land. You know, that's really what it comes back to is I, I am so praying and hoping that, that, that a new revival hits our country and that people get mm -hmm. serious for Jesus to push back darkness, to have another push, man, because like I said before, I know God's desires for all to be saved. And that's one of the missions we have as believers is to lead as many people to Christ as we can. And it's about being the light too, not just talking about it, but walking it out, you know? Uh, I think yep. there are a lot of people, man, that go that have that Sunday 
Christianity, but they don't really have an, a, a radical relationship with the Lord. And it's a challenge I put forth to myself, too, is I need to go deeper. We all need to go deeper and get more intimate with God. Um, if you if I were to ask you, Josh, like, you know, who's your like I say, who's your best friend? Like, who do you love more than anyone? You're going to tell me your spouse, your wife. You're, you're getting married here, right? Right around the corner. I am getting married. Yeah, yeah. yeah. you would. Yeah, you would. You would tell me that's your fiance, and then I would say, "Well, tell right. me a little bit of that about that fiance." And you should be able to tell me everything, know everything about her, right? But a lot of Christians, yep. if you ask them some things about Jesus, they may not know where he lived. They may not know all of his teachings. They they don't know a lot about Christ. And so, if we really right. know Christ, we know his heart. We're going to want to know more about him. And I think that's what it comes back to, man: is true relationship and not fan following. Right? Am I a fan of Jesus, or am I really intimate and close with Jesus? Do I really know Jesus? You know. Um, and I think that's a question yep. we all need to ask ourselves. And Paul said, "Examine yourselves to see whether you be in the faith." A lot of people get hung up with whether or not they are saved or. Once saved, always saved, and all these different doctrinal ideas. And I just say, examine yourself. Are you in the faith? You know, let's examine ourselves. Yeah. I think that's important for the body to do, and they will do it. I know it's going to happen, man. That's my prayer. But so, kind of getting back to the topic here of um, Trump being in office and all this stuff, we realized, man, that there is a huge security risk. He, they did not want him in office. They tried everything they could. The fact that he still made it in, I thought, was miraculous. To me, that's a well, sign. Well, he that, hasn't yet. You know, he well, hasn't yet. That's true. That's true. What, January 17th? I thought it was, yeah, 20th, whatever. I, I thought yeah, it was the 20th. But the yeah. inauguration is coming up, yeah. Yeah. So you're absolutely right. He hasn't made it in yet. And it seems like Obama's goal has been to do as much damage as, as he can before he gets into office, almost like he wants yeah. to start a war or something. Oh, Yeah. Yeah, on, on multiple fronts. You know, he does this land grab, the three times the state of Texas, for goodness sakes. Then he does what he does with Israel. Turns out that uh, him and John Kerry are the one that insti insti instigated this resolution. Uh, he's picking fights with everybody and their brother. He's antagonistic when it comes to these race relations. We saw that white kid getting beat in that Chicago apartment. Where was the president? Where was the president saying that we condemn racial violence? Right. Oh, wait, that didn't happen. So he's, he's, he's creating a bigger problem, and he's doing it to kind of throw a monkey wrench into. And it's not just him, though. And that's why it's, it's more than just one man. Look at what ha what's happening across the country. You have these people who are beating people because they see a Trump sticker on their car. This has, this has leapt the shark, in a sense, where we've now experienced a bunch of snowflake craziness, you mm -hmm. know, people needing safe spaces and all this sort of stuff, and just wait until safe Trump spaces, moves yeah. the U.S. Uh, embassy in Israel to Jerusalem. Just wait, because that's just going to take even more. So things are changing, things are coming, yeah. and that's why we have to be ready for them, and that's why there's watchmen on walls. Well, in, in regards to our open borders, man, that we've had, and technically the borders are not open, I realize that, but they might as well be from how things are handled in, in regards to immigration. There's a flood of people coming mm -hmm. over across the border. You know, a lot of people speculate, well, not even speculate, the FBI has told us, numerous agencies have told us, there is a huge terror threat here in the United States. Islam is flooded in. You know, overseas in Europe, uh, one of the first things that uh, – um, what is it? Angela Merkel said at Germany, uh, prime minister or president, what it, whichever it is. She said that uh, the biggest challenge is going to be for 2017. The biggest challenge is going to be to deal with the Islamic threat in Europe, because mm -hmm. what's happened is they've done the same thing that we're doing here from the standpoint that they ignore anything that Islam and the Muslims are doing. And then they crack down on everyone else. So it's like they're given a pass yeah. to do whatever they want. And now things are out of hand. Now in some of these foreign countries, you have a lot of fallout as a result of this. And I'm not here tonight to to um, attack Islam or Muslims. They're, they're people that need to be saved just like anybody else. But the problem is with any radical, uh, radicalized religion that is calling for violence, if you do not uh, regulate that and somehow squash it, not the religion, but the people that are radicalized within that religion, you're going to have serious problems. And 
you know, I, in some of these other countries, I know, what is it? Uh, China doesn't allow Islam into their country for this very reason. Japan, doesn't. Japan, Japan yeah, they don't allow them in, right? There's like one Muslim or something in the entire country recorded or something. It's an insane statistic, but they just basically shut it off. And so, man, I, I realize there's a danger with freedom of religion and all that, but how do you think that could play out here in the United States? Like when Trump takes over, do you think he really is going to lock down on the security and make lots of changes like he says he will? I hope he does. He might, but but because of the threat we're facing, it's kind of irrelevant. Because like you said, we're not fighting Bob. You know, it's not Bob right. we're fighting. We're fighting a radical ideology. Well, right. radical ideologies can grow even if nobody's allowed in the country. With the right. fastest growing religion in this country is Islam, and that's with nobody else coming in. You know, and, and I've been warning people of this, and it's actually now there's some proof that it's happening. I said, wait until radical Islam, CARE, the Muslim Student Association, all those terrible organizations, match up with Black Lives Matter. Because what you're going to have then is you're going to have a rapid increase of people who believe in Islam because they're going to have an, an ally that they can identify with. So even if you shut the border, no more Muslims in, if a year or two from now we're going to say, hey, wait a second, how did we get three million more Muslims? Well, because the religion itself grew. Yeah. That's, that's part of the problem. And it's, it's kind of, you know, people have been quoting it forever and attributing a lot of people to the quote, but you can't stop an idea. Yeah. And that's the problem with this. Because it's not just a religion. It's a political system that has a religious component. If you go back to Muhammad and what he was doing in Medina, this dude was not a religious guy. He was mm -hmm. a political guy that hijacked and created a religion. Some mm -hmm. people think with the funding of his first wife, who used to be a Catholic, but that became his vehicle to carry out his political ambition. And like how many people in this country don't even know that there's been 40 cases already in American courts where Sharia law was used as the precedent as opposed to U.S. law precedent, including the Constitution. Wow. That's already that is happened, which is why some organizations are pushing American laws for American courts because it's already here. Wow. That is scary, man. That is scary. And you know, one thing that's really interesting, Josh, when you look at the agenda that's being pushed, Right now, Islam gets a free pass, and also the homosexual lifestyle and perverse lifestyles and all these things get a pass. Well, here's the thing, man. Something's going to come to an head because here's the reason why. In Islam and in Muslim countries, if you're a homosexual or if you're involved in these perverse lifestyles outside of being a Muslim male, you're they kill you. They throw right. them off buildings. Right. And so it's literally a powder keg waiting to right. blow. If Islam continues to gain strength and momentum, all these people that are that are basically jamming down our throats, we need to accept the refugees and then promote yep. this homosexual lifestyle. We've got a powder keg we're sitting on. There's going to be a lot of violence. There could be a lot of violence between Islam and the the homosexual communities and stuff like that. I mean, the whole thing is just oh yeah it's a powder it really is a powder keg but um man i just again the only thing that's going to change what's going on i think right now is is prayers of of the saints you know praying and becoming yep. becoming real christians and influencing people and leading people to christ you know political policy and war is not ever really going to be the solution you know, that's I, I think the enemy's plan it ultimately is war because it destroys more and more people. Oh, yeah. But again, man, I am not uh, I want everyone to be saved. I want as many people to be saved as possible. But we also have to realize the threats and stuff that are out there. And right now, man, I just uh, it'll be interesting to see in 2017 what the new agenda is in the media. Like, do they continue to go down the same path? Because if so, eventually we're going to come to a head where there's conflict of mm -hmm. interest. And that's already kind of starting to happen on the racial side of mm -hmm. things. Black Lives Matter. Well, if you're going to go that route, you could say, you know, the police are saying blue lives matter. You have all these tensions, these polarized tensions going on. Um, and it's it's I think this last election, man, people were just more emotional than they've ever been. I mean, there's so much on the line. And thank God Hillary did not make it in. I mean, can you imagine how <laughs> I mean, how would 
we would be really nervous about 2017 right now. Not that there isn't a lot oh, to be yeah. worried about, but can you imagine if she had made it in? Even with all the voter fraud and everything that they tried, she still did not make it in. And I have to believe that's miraculous, man. A guy yeah. that's a guy that's basically an outsider came in and won the election. This is a chance for a new some some real changes. Now, can he really drain the swamp? Do you think he really can, or do you think all the cronies and all the people that have caused the problems are just going to stay? Well, that's that's where there's a, a little bit of warning, and I want to circle back to that. But you're right because going back to what you're saying about it, it's going to hit ahead because right now you have the LBGTQQIA. Remember when it was just LBG? But anyway, now it's the LBGTQQIA. That community is advocating for more and more refugees, even though these refugees want to kill them. It's, it's lunacy. But back to what you were saying. Can he drain the swamp? I hope so. Uh, here's how it's working for me personally. I am giving him the benefit of the doubt for the first 100 days. But some of the appointments that he's making to cabinet positions are a little concerning. They just are. And I understand, get the council of multitudes, surround yourself with people that you don't necessarily agree with in order to get different viewpoints. And if that's the case, awesome. That's wisdom come to life, and that's business 101. Maybe, it's that, maybe that's his business skill floating to the top. But some of the concerns are, are a little iffy, so we'll have to see. We'll have to see who stays and who goes. I'm a little shocked that Paul Ryan maintained Speaker of the House. I mean, part of draining the swamp would be getting rid of people like Paul Ryan because you're talking about refugees. People can Google this on their own. O Obama pushed for 100,000 refugees to come in, Syrian refugees. Paul Ryan pushed for 300,000 Syrian refugees. Again, the bill that we opened talking about on this show was a Republican bill. So Paul Ryan is the epitome of part of the swamp that needs to be drained. And the fact that the incoming Congress propped him up as speaker again, a little concerning, but we'll see how it goes. I'm giving him the benefit of the doubt. I will say one thing I do like, man, is his relationship with Israel and his attitude towards Israel. Because in the past, we've been a friend of Israel, and what God's word says about Israel is what you make happen for them, he will make happen you. Now, as people will argue that the Israel we see today is not the true Israel that the Bible's talking about, I tend to disagree, man, because you've seen all these supernatural interventions where Israel has been saved time and time again. I think that this is the group we're talking about and not just like the tribe of Judah. That's a different show altogether. But I like the fact that he is so friendly towards Israel. He wants to move an embassy. What is it? He wants to move a uh, set up a U.S. embassy in Israel, which I guess has not happened. Well, we have one. We do? No, we, we have. Yeah, we have Jerusalem, one. We have one right? I, I, Jerusalem. Okay. Yeah, he wants to move it to Jerusalem. Okay. So right now we got one, but it's in uh, Tel Aviv. So he wants to move it to Jerusalem, and that would essentially say America recognizes Jewish or Israel's position that mm -hmm. Jerusalem is the capital of, of Israel. So yeah. that would be something that we haven't done. And if that happens, that's an interesting, and that's an interesting play because Israel's neighbors are going to be really upset about that. So are the Muslims in Europe, and so are all the Muslims here in America with the 35 or whatever now terrorist training camps that the FBI knows about but refuses to shut down. So it's going to be an interesting time. Yeah, absolutely. Well, um, is there anything else that uh, you'd like to talk about in regards to this topic or anything else that's been on your mind? And while you're talking for a moment, I just want to open it up. Anybody in chat right now that has any questions, I'll try and fire a few off before we're done. I can take a few questions, but uh, go ahead there, Josh. Do you have anything else that you want to kind of close out with? Uh, well, Hear the Watchman. I want to talk about Hear the Watchman. Of yeah. course, plug my book a little bit, of Entrepreneur, get a copy. Uh, but Hear the Watchman. I really want to promote this event because I've been to two of them now. This is going to be my third. And, you know, we, we were talking earlier about how churches are not talking about the relevant issues. And mm -hmm. I told you how I've run into at least 15 believers who said I stopped going to church. Well, here are the Watchmen events kind of fill that. It's a right. live event, so you have this live community, you meet new people. I had somebody meet at my table, somebody who lives in their same neighborhood. They were like, oh man, 
Nobody in my area talks about this. I said, where do you live? And they said, the guy standing next to him says, wait a second. I live like two streets down from you. I didn't know anybody in my neighborhood believed the way I did. Wow. So that's one of the powerful benefits of Hear the Watchman. It also allows these messages that you're not hearing from the pulpits. Mm -hmm. And it allows it from a lot of different speakers and honestly, a lot of different perspectives, which I think is absolutely vital. The Bible tells us, come, let us reason together. And the mm -hmm. fact that the organizers of this event did such a great job in getting speakers that necessarily don't see eye to eye is mm -hmm. a godsend. That's a right. gift. I am sick and tired of these Christians saying, well, I'm not going to go to that because that speaker I don't agree with. Stop it. Nobody yeah. knows this 100% except God, and he's not here. We're all trying to figure this out. And if your pastor or Internet YouTube the theologian that you're listening to thinks that they know everything, the one thing you can know is that they're wrong. Nobody knows everything. So to get a different perspectives yeah. together is absolutely genius. And I'm so glad. I think, what, half the crew over there at Skywatch is coming? Yeah, and honestly, Josh, this is going to be the first conference I've ever uh, been able to speak at. So this is a huge honor for me to be able to speak alongside somebody like you and many of these guys who've been carrying the torch for years. It's a huge honor and just a big responsibility. And I'm really looking forward to it, man. I think it's going to be a great time. Um, if you guys are in the Dallas area or if you're in a neighboring state, uh, please go to hearthewatchman.com. And you can enter a promo code where you can get a discount. Uh, did you get a promo code there, Josh? Yes, I did. I got I got Tully, but feel okay. free to use one if you have one. Well, go I, for I'm it. just going to tell people right now, if you want to go to Hear the Watchman and you want to attend, if you enter the code Tully, Josh's last name, You'll get a discount. You'll save 10, uh, I think it's like $20, 20 yeah, off the price. Guys, it's like, I want to say it's like 100 bucks after that. This is going to be like a two-day deal. Uh, no, three-day because it's Friday, Saturday, into Sunday afternoon. They're going to have a special uh, lunch that you can attend with the speakers. Um, they're going to have some really yep. great stuff. It's going to be an amazing time. So go to hearthewatchman.com and check that out. Um, but uh, – Again, Josh, I want to thank you for joining me tonight, man. It's been really an honor and pleasure to to discuss these topics with you, man. I think we hit on some really important stuff. Yeah. And I look forward to talking with you soon. And, you know, the next time you come back to Skywatch, that'll be great too. But, uh, man, I will see you down in Dallas. So, I'll um, see guys, uh, oh, here's the thing. Here's the thing. Sure. We got had a question come out here that I just want to address real quick. Someone basically asked, they said, do you think something really big will happen before Trump is president? Like, do you think something major is going to happen? Uh, well, here's, here's my prediction. And again, I want to preface this by saying it's not a prophecy. I'm not saying right. God said it all. But my prediction is that between uh, winning the election and the event, between now and about eight months, I think something big is going to happen. I really do. I think we are going to have... And a 9-11 sort of attack. Yeah. And, you know, whatever people want to think about that, go ahead. Mm -hmm. <laughs> but I, I think there's going to be that level of an attack because the, whoever he has angered is going to want to send a message. And right. they're going to want to send the message that Donald did not make you safer. You chose wrong. Because Donald Trump is your president – Pain and punishment is coming to America. That's the message they're going to want to send, whoever they happen yeah. to be. But that's that's my prediction is, yeah, something is going to happen in the next eight months. Okay, awesome. Well, before we go, guys, I just wanted to mention real quick, if you're part of this community watching this and you're interested in helping us moderate things and chat rooms and discussions and things like that, we're looking for some people to help us out as we grow and I've got a few other arenas I'm looking for help in, too. I'm looking for a Christian programmer that's interested in collaborating with me on a project, primarily someone who knows, like, SQL database-type scripting, and they can do um, uh, GPS coordinates, stuff like that. I can't exactly talk exactly what it's about yet, but I'm working on a little project that um, I'm hoping somebody can help me with that I can collaborate with, and I can give you credits, and we can work out. Uh, how to compensate you or whatever. But I just wanted to mention that. Uh, guys, thank you for joining us. Uh, come back here in a little bit because I'm going to be on tonight. I've got another guest uh, coming up tonight. Uh, we're going to be having a discussion. His name is, and I apologize, guys, this is on the fly. I've been talking with so many people. 
Um, the guest I've got coming up later is uh, Todd Gilbert, and he's got some real interesting co- topics we're going to cover. And then late tonight from 10 to midnight, I'm going to be on Truth Frequency Radio Network with Sheila Zelensky. She's joining me. So, guys, I'm pretty much going all night. We're going to have a break now between now and, say, like 830 And then from then on, it's going to be the rest of the night. So God bless you guys. Hang on with me one second, Josh, and we will see you guys next time here on The Sharpening Report.